Liz Hughes Bart, and I make dope portraits for dope people. And this is my art studio. So when I was 13, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And I was actually one of the older kids in that hospital unit. So whenever the Nintendo 64 would go around, I would never get it because all of the younger patients were essentially prioritized um, ahead of me, which in all fairness, I would have done too. But all I wanted to do was play Smash Butters to kill time at the hospital. So I was given pen and paper instead and I would actually draw everyone who would come in and out of my hospital room. And with that, I actually ended up with a whole wall of all these drawings of people that were strangers. And essentially it was like my first solo art show. And look at me now. Um, born and raised in New York City, Queens girl, Elmhurst, New York. Moved around quite a bit. Um, was living in for the majority of my life, um, moved to New Hampshire, which was different. I mean, growing up in New York, you were just surrounded by this bustling diversity. Didn't matter who you were, where you came from. Most of the time, people would look at you and mind their own business, but you were just immediately accepted. New Hampshire wasn't like when I tell you going to school in New Hampshire was like that one scene in Mean Girls where the guy is like, oh, those are the jocks. And like, oh, those are the popular girls. And oh, that's how the seating area for the lunch was. Never experienced that in my life. You would just go and sit with whomever, whenever. And I remember going into the school as this like artsy kid who I felt just got along with everyone just kind of like sat at whatever table and I ended up sitting at the popular girls table which was hmm, needless to say a huge no-no um I guess then I was labeled as the new girl they didn't give me a category to uh fit in quite yet so I was just the new girl so of course it was like all these questions were like Oh, so where you're from? Who do you like? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, I just got here. I don't know any of you. I don't like any of you. Um, and kind of got sworn into the popular kid group, which cool, whatever. I didn't really consider them the popular girls. I just considered them a group of girls that just were friends and sat together at lunch. Um, and I remember wanting to it with the art kids one day because it was the class that I enjoyed the most. Um, I actually was put in music class. So the way that the school worked was they had these extracurricular activities for art. So you had music, art, dance, and I think drama. And they would just put you in one of them. You didn't get to choose. So they put me in music and music was right next to the class. So anytime I had music class, I would actually go to the bathroom and just stand outside of the art room and like look inside the class and just see what they were doing. Never like return back to music class until like the end of the period. They must have thought I had some weird bladder problems. And I would just stand and like stare at the art department. So I was trying to get to know the art kids and kind of like get more of an insight of what they were doing. Um, and eventually, their teacher noticed I was just this weird girl standing outside of her window, <laughs> just like looking in. Um, and she would just let me go to the art classes instead of the music class, and that all worked out. But anyways, started sitting with the art kids, and the popular girls did not like this because I was all of a sudden associated with them, and they could not have one of their own associated with the others. Um, very weird school. Um, so my mom had noticed all these drawings and was like, you know what? There's something here. Let's put you in art school and see if this can be something for you. And I was like, okay, sounds great, mom. Now, my mom, <laughs> she finds this school. Um, it's called Red, Yellow, and Blue Art School. And they only 
is both your derivative. Oh. Which I do not speak. Anyway, at this school, um, they would start you off with images of cartoons and have you kind of replicate that and figure out how to draw shapes and shadows and yada yada yada. And once you got to a certain level, they would move you on to charcoal and graphite and portraits. And so they would have people come in to basically sit down to pose and you would draw them. Um, and the instructor would go around and basically give you like tips on how to make it better. Now, of course, me not knowing Mandarin had no idea what my instructor was telling me to do. So I only had to rely on what I saw and what I felt at the same time. So a lot of these charcoal portraits are actually what I did at that school. And I was at the school for three years, not knowing the language, all right? Um, but there was something about drawing portraits of somebody that I couldn't communicate with or knew nothing about, but had to capture their essence in a sense and like their emotions within an hour. Um, and really, really just got into charcoal as a medium over time. And so was doing this for years, really enjoyed it. And that got to a point where I was like, I miss color. And um, at this point, my instructor was learning like a little bit of English because I was the only English student after three years and another English student came in and it was like, all right, I need to learn some words. But anyway, so he was suggesting painting to me and um, I needed to break away from portraits and so I was doing landscapes. And so that actually is my very first painting. Um, I mean, it's good. Do I love it and connect it to it? Not so much. It's just my first painting, and so I, you know, keep it for memories. So I started wanting to get back to my charcoal roots. And so I decided to go about it in a big way, obviously. So uh, this canvas is about five feet by six feet, and I'm 5'8", so I tower over it like just a little bit. Um, but to be honest with you, it's actually really comfortable like doing something that's, you know, your body <laughs> like size. Um, working small for me, I was always so concentrated on like the littlest of details, right? And that's just me with my technical background. I found out about this dance where there's this thing called numb, which is what the series is called. And it's this potent, spiritual, undefinable energy that starts off in the dancer's stomach and as the dance progresses it goes from the ribs up the spine and to the skull and so each part of the painting that I'm doing is actually the stage of the dance so he is in the very beginning stages where it's still in the stomach so once he's done he'll have like the ribs kind of painted over him um, and I'm adding these botanicals to symbolize the numb. So I like to do a contour map of all of the shadows and highlights and midtones of the painting. So if you get up close to it, um, you'll actually see all these little like linear pencil marks. And that lets me know that, okay, this is like one type of shadow, this is going to be another kind of shadow, and so on and so forth, so that when I start applying depth and value to it, um, I know that when I go ahead and put a shadow in, it's not going to exceed this mark. It's not going to go into like a more transitional tone and go just a little bit lighter than what this was. And a good way for me to kind of keep track of it is doing all the darkest parts first. So that way, I know as I go on, a shadow can't go darker than this particular point. So I know like, this is my darkest, that's my darkest, right her little chin right there is dark, and that right here is gonna be all dark. And as I continue to add more darker tones and even pull back the lighter tones, 
I know I can't exceed this. Everything kind of has to be in coexistence with one another. I'll use that word, coexistence. I know there's a better word out there, not common to me.